questions. And today we are very excited to have our third lecture on the topic of climate change disaster and governance in Taiwan. Professor Lin is an assistant professor at National Taiwan Normal University Institute of Environmental Education. As a geographer by training, Professor Lin's work has been addressing on the notion of natural disasters, vulnerability, and also risk communications. Her work integrates diverse data sources such as historical, environmental data, climate change data, combined with extensive field work in local areas to reinterpret the notion of risks and communication as well as society's response to disasters. So let's welcome Professor Lin to give us a talk on climate change, disasters, and governance in Taiwan. Hi, um, hi everyone. It's a great pleasure to join this lecture series and also give uh, this talk on climate change disaster and governance in Taiwan. Um, like Professor Wen once introduced, I have been uh, widely studied climate change vulnerability, adaptation and disaster risk issues in Taiwan for more than 10 years. So based on those research experiences, I hope I can give you a brief review of the uh, uh, climate change related disaster and how the Taiwanese governance collaborates with different parties from local community and enterprises to cope with all those incre increasing uh, climate disaster risks. So I'm going to share my slide. Okay, so here is the outline for the talk for today. Um, there, there are many three main parts. The first section is about Taiwan under climate change, the physical and geographical aspects of those risks. The second part are talking about the vulnerability as coupled human and the environmental constructions in Taiwan. And the third part is the disaster risk governance in Taiwan. And today I didn't prepare a lot of slides because I hope that I can give every slide some more time and to give you uh, really, to let you really understand um, the whole situations here. And if there's any questions and just um, can post your questions and then, then I can later answer. Okay, so here is the climate warming overall in the, on the earth. So I think you are all familiar with those. Like the left hand chart, it shows the temperature, in, temperature anomaly in the past 10,000 uh, years. And as you can see that there is definitely a fluctuation of temperature change in the last 10,000 years. But the red line, the red curve short, the sharp increase of the temperature in the last 100 years. And of course, the right hand side, you can see a very strong signal of warming temperature over the red color on the earth. And um, the lower right hand side also shows the, the temperature anomaly in the last 100 years. So overall, in the last 100 years, our temperature has increased more than 1.4 degrees C. Okay, so here is a IPCC AR5 report and they have done a lot of scenarios to interpret the future temperature. And the scenarios goes from the blue part in the bottom is RCP 2.6, going up to the RCP 8.5, the different scenarios of temperature increase in the end of the century. And as far as you can see that on the right hand side, you see how the extreme events and how the impacts there could be related to the climate warming. And so, uh, so what Paris Agreement um, announced is that uh, the goal for the 
for the whole world is to make the temperature increase below two degrees C before the Industrial Revolution era. So that would be the red line here. So if the temperature in the end of the century persists two degrees C or up to four or five degrees C, then you can see a lot of uh, uh, dangerous situations that we will face and a lot of extreme weather events and uh, globally aggregate impacts from this climate warming season. So consistent to the climate projection, in many of the global disaster risk assessments, and this is from Swiss Re, and uh, actually there are many of those kinds of uh, assess disaster risk assessments, and you can definitely see a very obvious increase in trend over the uh, disaster risk in the last 30, in the last 30 uh, years. And among all, you can see that meteorological events, including tropical storm and these uh, different kinds of storm and hydro hydrological events comprises the major part of all the world disaster trends. Okay, so uh, this also points out that although the climate is warming, but uh, the impacts related to warming also uh, re lead to uneven rainfall and precipitation in space and in time. So for example, um, I don't know why now I cannot play uh, this, this video, but uh, maybe you can copy this uh, address here and then pause it on the internet to see this scenario later. But this very nice scenario was made by NOAA Center and it uh, illustrates the changes of precipitation over the world um, under climate warming. And it also illustrates the enlarging uh, droughts and dry and wet uh, conditions because of the climate warming. And of course, that is a very critical and very important message because that's related to the water resources and water insecurity issues. So that is also one thing that uh, which makes the hydrological, meteorological, and climatological events become so severe uh, under the warming climate warming season. And it, uh, in spite of the warming and the uneven uh, precipitation, rainfall, storms, floods, landslides, and there are uh, because we are Taiwan is located in the uh, East Asia, and so we are very much pay attention to the typhoon, the hurricane, uh, which are which constitutes major disaster uh, risk to uh, the Taiwanese society. So under climate warming, there are also a lot of analysis uh, to discover uh, the typhoon pattern in the future. So here is a very nice chart. And this demonstrates the genesis of typhoons in the 20th century. And so as you can see, uh, many typhoons, they, the genesis are in this uh, central Pacific from the uh, Middle American to the, to the Asia. Uh, this part, the tropical part, okay? And this is a scenario for the genesis of typhoon in the 21st century. Of course, from this chart, the A chart to the B chart, from the ice, we probably could not distinguish a large differences in spite that you can see more stronger signals here. So here comes the chart C, uh, chart C is to use the scenario of the 21st century to minus the observed trend in the 20th century. And as you can see, the brown and red color 
illustrate the increasing trend of the genesis of typhoons and the green parts illustrate the decreasing genesis trend of the typhoons. So as you can see, there are some, some increasing and some decreasing, although, but this is, the, this chart only demonstrates uh, probably the frequency and or the number of typhoons in total. But a more important message from the right chart here is a scenario made uh, for project the intensity of the typhoons. And as you can see that the black bar shows the typhoon intense typhoon number. Uh, the year number uh, in the 20th century with the typhoon wind speed over, uh, I mean, the different wind speed. So for example, the black bar shows the 20th century and you can find that uh, most of the, uh, the 20th century has more typhoons with a uh, typhoon year the, with more years that have typhoon with wind speeds less than uh, 35. But as you can find that stronger wind speeds are going to happen in the 21st century in the future. So which indicates that although we probably wouldn't have a large increase or even decrease of the typhoon frequencies. But when typhoon came, the intensity definitely could possibly stronger than before. Okay, so that is the global view, global perspective of climate change disaster, especially those extreme events and um, the typhoon uh, hazard. And what about now I'd like to introduce what is the situation in Taiwan? So um, as I just mentioned, in the last 100 years, global annual temperature increase is 1.4 degrees C. Uh, so here is the Taiwan temperature. So it's from nine, 1910 to 2018. So we can see this uh, centennial increasing trend of the temperature. And, uh, but if you, took, if you take the 50 year trend, you can see it's a sharper increase. And even in, in last 10 years, the temperature increase even is even more obvious. So here, the bottom, this chart, indicates the mean temperature anomaly, anomaly in Taiwan. So you can see that uh, it's a standardized. So you can see that in the last 30 years, the temperature increase is extremely obvious also in Taiwan. So in Taiwan, it's, uh, in average, per decade temperature increase is 0 0.14 degrees C, and the global average for the decade, per decade, is 0 0.074 degrees C, which means that the temperature increase in Taiwan is more obvious than global mean uh, temperature increase. Okay, and, uh, and this chart, this map shows um, because of the warming trend, uh, we will have more se severe heat waves in Taiwan. So if we take into account the daily high temperature higher than 35 degrees C, and then you can see the changes of the dates um, in different cities. For example, this is Taipei city, the biggest city and also capital in Taiwan. And you can see that averagely from 1960 to 1975, there are in total 21 days have the temperature, highest temperature 
larger than 35. But in uh, 2000 to 2016, the date has already been doubled. And the future is going to be double again in the end of the century. So this is Taipei. And if you look at Taichung, which is in the central part of Taiwan, Taipei is here, and Taichung, and then Kaohsiung is here. So if you look at this, is a Taichung trend. It's going to the, the temperature increase and the heat wave are going to be several times than the previous eras. Okay, so um, in addition to the temperature increase in Taiwan, now here this chart shows that the enlarging wet and dry countries also uh, observed and in the future time. So here is the, the, the curve you see it here, illustrates the accumulates the annual rainfall. So we can see that in the later part, the fluctuations of the annual uh, rainfall is really uh, fluctuated quite obviously. And so you can see that the more when the, uh, when the years the years with more uh, rainfall is increasing uh, the rainfall trend. But this, the year with the lower rainfall, it is also increasing uh, lower volume of the total rainfall. So um, the way dry contrast is obvious. And of course, this would influence the water scarcity issues and also related to the water management. Uh, like this is food insecurity, the lower temperature, uh, higher temperature and more way dry contrast would influence the crop yield from the early 20th century to, lower, to this obvious drop in the late uh, 21st century. And also, uh, it will influence the epidemic outbreak. For example, this is uh, the mosquitoes uh, related to dengue fever. And you can see uh, 30 years, uh, 30, 20 years ago, we only had the uh, dengue fever mosquitoes here, but the whole chain is going, is projected to growing northward uh, in the end of the century. So a lot of issues can be related to the climate temperature change and also the uh, enlarging contrast precipitation pattern. So except the uh, climate change related uh, disasters, Taiwan has already had a lot of geological aspects that uh, can brought us a lot of landslides, earthquakes, and uh, the kind of geological risks uh, is because Taiwan is located in the intersection of the Philippine Sea Plate, the techno tectonically, and also the Euro Euro-Asia Plate. And there are many uh, falls that you can see uh, through going through the the whole island. And uh, that, of course, this uh, geological formation process not only make Taiwan has very uh, sharp topography, like more than 1,000 mountain peaks higher than 3,000 meters, uh, but also that geological uh, characteristic, characteristics compounded with the typhoon increasing typhoon intensity trend and also the enlarging uh, wet, dried uh, trends that can uh, produce great disaster risk in Taiwan. So here is a UNISDR report about the global, uh, about the disaster risk it's in every country. And here is Taiwan. And because of the geological and uh, 
the meteorological effects Taiwan constantly ranked by many international institutions as having the high uh, disaster risk uh, that the governments the governments need to deal with. So here is just an example for you to see what kinds of the compounding geological and the meteorological risk that Taiwan can face in the past years. So for example, you can see to remote uh, uh, to the uh, satellite images. Those two images are indicating the same location. So can you tell the difference of these two images? Here, this image is before a very serious, very strong typhoon Morocco in 2009. This is me for before Typhoon Morocco uh, struck Taiwan. And you can see that there is a steel village here. It's called the Shaolin village. And uh, after Typhoon Morocco, as you can see, this village was totally buried by the landslides and also the debris flow, flash flood um, along this river. So, and uh, many studies have uh, have been published after this type of Morocco uh, catastrophe, and the type, uh, and this Shaolin village is just one example of the compounding disasters in Taiwan in the last twenty years, especially. So, uh. In this type of Morocco, the accumulated rainfall is over 3,000 millimeters. So in total, uh, oh, more than 600 people died and the economic loss is 6.7 million US dollars. So here you can see that uh, type of Morocco from 2009, August 5th to 10th, the accumulated, accumulated rainfall is largely largely gathered in the central to southern part of Taiwan. So Shaolin village is located in this uh, Kaohsiung, the northern part of the Taiwan. Uh, sorry, the southern part of Taiwan. So here is a chart showing the typhoon rainfall accumulate, accumulated typhoon rainfall for seven severe typhoons in the in the history, and this black curve you can see is typhoon Morocco. And we, of course, we obviously we also have several typhoons, but none of those typhoons have such a stronger accumulated rainfall. And in, it also lasts more than two days. So brought a lot of uh, excessive rainfall for Taiwan. So this type of Morocco uh, also recall to uh, what the typhoon projection by the many analysis that I just mentioned in the previous slides. That although we don't have many typhoons every year, but the typhoon came with a stronger intensity. Okay, so uh, maybe we can ignore this one. And this one also introduces that uh, um, this is a, a, the green blue shading part indicates the annual rainfall uh, from 1970 to uh, 2008. And uh, you can see this uh, purple bar, those are the typhoon rainfall percentage in the annual rainfall. So you can see almost typhoon rainfall percentages almost occupies or dominates the annual rainfall in Taiwan, which also means that whenever a typhoon comes, definitely brought a lot of precipitation. 
but when the year without any typhoon, then we have a high risk of uh, in lack of uh, uh, the rainfall, which can build as some drought and and water insecurity uh, problem. Okay, so uh, the above is the first part, Taiwan under climate change. And the second part, I'm going to talk about the vulnerability as coupled human and the environmental constructions in Taiwan. So based on the meteorological and the geolo geological char characteristics in Taiwan, now uh, I give you some fact sheets. So this map shows the debris flow in Taiwan and stronger color, which means that a stronger uh, uh, risk of the risk flow hazard. And this map shows landslide uh, percentage. And of course, a stronger card also shows a stronger uh, percentage. And, and however, this map also shows the indigenous population ratio in Taiwan. So as you can see, the more the stronger color shows where the most of the indigenous people live. And you can find that uh, this map, the spatial distribution of the density comes quite well with the land size map and also the debris flow map. And uh, this very right hand side map was from another uh, scatter who did the social vulnerability index for Taiwan. So uh, the pink color shows the, the, the index value larger than 1.5 standard deviation, which means that's extreme vulnerable. And this, the green, this green color shows the least vulnerable. For example, this is uh, central Taipei city, it is least vulnerable. And this uh, central mountain range era, the people living here suffer from the highest social vulnerability. So you can see this map also very much correspond to the indigenous, gene, indigenous people distribution map. And also very comes very consistent with the the bridge flow and landslide map. So why is that? It's because that, uh, like what, like I mentioned before, Taiwan was situ situated in the inter in the intercourse of the intersection of the um, Philippine Sea Plate and the Euro Asia uh, continental plate. So when the two plates meet each other. And then here is the central Taiwan mountain range was produced uh, through the mountain movement in the geological time. So it's high central mountain ranges and also the, it's also the homeland for the indigenous people. So now I think this gives you an insight of who is the most vulnerable to the hazard. So let's look at the, this right-hand side chart. This is the type of Morocco victim statistics. And, and this is the death category, and this is the injury category. And you can find that uh, for the, no better for the death or for the in injury category, indigenous people always have higher risk probability than the non-indigenous people. Also, uh, this table shows uh, also from the type of Morocco statistics. And this column, which I point here, the first column, it shows the uh, Taiwan Social Change Survey. It is, this survey can demonstrate uh, or represent the general Taiwanese people's occupation pattern. And you can see that most of the most uh, high percentage gathering clerk 
and some、uh, officials, and of course there are some non-work forces like elderly and young people, or students. And those three columns shows the Morocco victim survey. And you can see that this is Shaolin village, and this is indigenous fam family of the Tavo Morocco victim. And this is a non-indigenous people, and they are also not belong to Shaolin village. They are just victims, but they are not indigenous. It's just regular re regular Han and Taiwanese people. So you can see that for Shaolin village, there are a lots of、uh, people. They were manual worker. Or officials before Typhoon Morocco, but it's very different、uh, if you look at the statistic of the indigenous family because the non-workforce and manual worker and also farmer occupies the main occupation of those indigenous victims over Typhoon Morocco, and、uh, also. Uh, even non-indigenous people, there are very high percentage of the of farmers. So these three groups actually represent、uh, very different、uh, social profiles of the victims in Typhoon Morocco. So we then want to study the disaster risk derived from the, this Typhoon Morocco event. So we use some equations to do the analysis. The first equation is that risk is the is the multiply of the hazard exposure and the vulnerability, and that we also use the second equation from the IPCC and some previous scatters, and it says that vulnerability is a function of exposure sensitivity, resilience, and adaptive capacity. So,、um, if you are interested in this analysis, or if you are not so familiar with all those terms, I encourage you that you can probably see our paper here or see other、uh, vulnerability or disaster risk related papers. So, for this type of Morocco analysis, we do two phase analysis. The first phase is to we want to discover the constituting factors. Of typhoon disaster risk, and the second phase, we want to measure or estimate the effect of resilience, on vulnerability, and recovery of those victims of typhoon Morocco. So, in phase one, we integrate two different data sets. The first one is the TSCS, that is the Taiwan Social Transition Survey that I just introduced in the previous table, which represents the Taiwanese average, and the SIR Sears、uh, survey is for Typhoon Morocco victim victims. So we use、uh, these two data sample.、Uh, To analyze who are the most vulnerable for the typhoon disaster risk, and we did this the logistic regression model. I will introduce you more later. Okay, here is the statistics、uh, of the own data. So,、uh, to study typhoon Morocco, we put、uh, we have. Different categories for the disaster risk. We have victimization, mortality rate, and injury rate, economic loss. Those are treated as dependent、uh, variables. So it represents disaster risk. And for the natural hazard category, we have four different hazard types: as the risk flow streams, strong precipitation, flood, and landslide. And then for the exposure category, we have the family size before Morocco and family size after Morocco. And to major vulnerability, and we use the different、uh, factors. For example, like place inequality,、uh, we measure the occupations of the victim family, and also education, also ethnicity. And also their family types, 
And we also use social capital to measure resilience and, uh, and their recovery. So I will, so those are the uh, descriptive statistics and we are going to, we put in the model estimate. So for the phase one model results, which integrates uh, these two data set, we can see that uh, Uh, if you consider homeless, which also is victimization, uh, who the victims who, who lost their home, you can see that the nature hazard variable does occupy an important uh, proportion to make this homeless process. But except that, you can see that the family size before Typhoon Morocco, the more family members they have in the family, they have higher disaster risk. And also you found this uh, control class, manual worker, farmers, especially farmers and un un unemployed and lower education and Abor Aboriginal and uh, uh, not married and all those factors are closely related and contribute to the victim, victimization and the homeless uh, process. Uh, all those statistics are significant. But if you consider the mortality rate, you can see that the hazard variable are still significant. And uh, farmer and uh, uh, slower education and now married, uh, or single family, also relevant variables. For injury and for economic loss, uh, some variables are still uh, significant and some are not. But I think the first two models can quite represent that uh, uh, the, who, is this, who is most likely to suffer from the typhoon hazard are more likely those who has lower social economic class, uh, classes and uh, or lower uh, year of schooling about regional and uh, all those um, single uh, family. And um, this chart shows the annual income, family annual income before and after Typhoon Morocco. And uh, you can see the TSCS sample shows that uh, is here is the year of Typhoon Morocco. And uh, most of the Taiwan uh, family income has a slight, slightly increasing after years. And the uh, Typhoon Morocco's big teams, their family income lowered in the first year. And the second year is going up. And but the third year, the income range decreases a little bit. But if you consider the trend of the two curves that you observed, the income gap between the big team and the general Taiwanese pattern is actually increases, obviously. Okay, so this is a phase two. We measure the effects of resilience, which is represented by social capital. Because as for a long time, scholars argue that when people have higher social capital can bring them more resources to increase their re resilience and adaptability. So now we want to measure if that uh, social capital uh, can really get benefits into that uh, recovery process. Okay, so um, the key message here is that so you, you can see the dependent variable. This is the family income before Morocco. And this is the family income. We use the income 
uh, family income in 2012 to minus those in 2009. So it's going, it said a uh, fixed effect model. And in this model, you can see that uh, actually if we, if you see the difference between the two years and you found that uh, actually in this second model, although the clerk and the unemployed seems to be, and also manual work and farmer seems to be significant, but most of the variables are not so significant, which means that uh, after Tefal Morocco, many variables, they are not so, uh, in, so statistic, statistic, statistically relevant to the re, uh, family income recovery, especially those are the social capital variable, variables that I just mentioned, like meeting with neighbors or aid from the kingship or friends or aid from the institutions. You can see that all those uh, variables are not major significant in the models. And in other words, what influence the family income recovery are still largely dominated by their social economic class classes three years after Tefo Morocco. Uh, so this is another chart to show you that uh, Again, this is so since we say since in this previous slide, we found that uh, the resilience variables are not so relevant. Uh, if you look at the family income three years after the Morocco, because all those are dominated by the social economic classes. So if we look more detail into the uh, uh, social economic classes in terms of their occupation type, you can find that generally in 2009, uh, most of the Taiwanese people's occupation uh, gather in this uh, manual worker, clerk, and control class. Control class is basically officials. And for the Typhoon Morocco's victims, you can see that before 2009, they majorly, they mainly gather in farmer, manual worker, and then you found in you, 2010 increasing unemployment rate and then its unemployment and non workforce rates increases and also in 2012 you found that unemployment rate still increases and also manual worker increases and surprisingly control class also increases and and here is also a table indicates the social class movements in 2009 into 2012. So how to see that is that, for example, control class in 2009, 33.96 uh, percentage and in 2009 uh, is control class and in 2012 is also a uh, control class. It stay in the same occupation level. And, but you see, for example, this manual worker is 18.87, which means that uh, this percentage of people, they were uh, control class in 2009, but downwarded, became manual worker in 2012. Okay, so this is a table to discover the occupation movement of the Morocco victims. And you can see that most of the most of the uh, people, the Morocco victims, present a downward trend. For example, clerk, uh, high percentage become a uh, non workforce or manual worker, a high percentage become unemployed. Of course, there there should be some people stay in the same occupation level, but you can see other bills those downgrading of the occupation. 
But in the meantime, you also found some, found some upgrading of this trend. For example, 27% of farmer in 2009 becoming control class, which means official, like school teachers or officials working in governments or um, employments, 13.02 in 2009 becomes a manual worker in 2012. Okay, so this is an it, it, this is an interesting trend, upgrading trend for the social class movement uh, in the two time period. So this illustrates a resilience concept that uh, for many people they are not when they're confronting the disaster going down of their social season, they are not expecting to going up again. For, furthermore, uh, some uh, society or some social groups or some population, when they are confronting a hazard or an environmental stresses, they not only can going back to their previous status, some of them might cross the threshold to into another um, regime. Uh, this can be like the farmers uh, gradually become control class after the uh, typhoon strike. Then of course there are some uh, support or some institutional resources from the governments or enterprises to help the victims to uh, upgrade their occupation level. And those are quite some uh, contextual uh, or narratives um, uh, uh, I mean some institutional um, uh, narratives from the Taiwanese society that end to help the victims and uh, that is another story. I hope I can have some time to introduce that later. And uh, so here is a, a local story, a community perspective about the type of Morocco strike. Then I can introduce more narratives uh, in, the, in the later slides. So this is the Namasha district. It is located in Kaohsiung city, which is uh, mostly uh, struck by typhoon Morocco and had a lot of uh, uh, landslides and rainfalls. So here is the before image. This is the after me, uh, image. And here is Xiaolin village that I just introduced you. And here is the after the whole village buried uh, by the landslides. And uh, if you go further, there are three more tribal groups in the upstream of the river, which is Nansalu, Maya, and Dakanua tribal groups. And these two tribal groups, they don't have people died. And Nansalu have 35 people died. And uh, for, uh, for these three um, uh, villages, uh, for example, very important because the government don't want them to relocate after Typhoon Morocco in the same locations. Of course, um, Shaolin, village, Shao Shaolin village has been buried. So the survivors have been relocated in other locations. And the government also urges the Nansado villagers to be relocated in other separate locations and also Maya and Dakanua. But in the end, um, only a few people in Nansalu uh, village relocated, agreed to be relocated. And very few men, families from Maya and Dakanua have agreed to be relocated, although they are really very remote uh, from accessibility and, and also suffer from uh, dense lights and debris flow has a risks. So what I like to mention here is that uh, like uh, Shaolin and Nansalu, they have suffered from direct 
has a risk from typhoon, landslides, and debris flows. Maya and Dakanua, although they also suffer from more or less these kinds of hazards, but they don't have direct exposed uh, human losses in those uh, hazards. In the other hand, for them, more critical issue is the livelihood recovery and how what is the long-term livelihood challenges after the typhoon miracle and in the coming future typhoons. So what I'd like to introduce here is the livelihood vulnerability, which means that although some remote villages they don't have direct exposure to the instant hazards, but they do suffer from the livelihood related difficulties uh, in, their life, in, in their daily life. For example, if you want to travel to those remote villages, you probably need to drive over two hours. And so when typhoons track, the road system can be totally destroyed, which means that for those remote villages, they probably don't have transportation in one month or even two months. And when that happens, most of them are farmers for their livelihood, or they have some tourist attractions. Then, which means that in those two months or even longer time, they would not have any economic income sources. So those are the different kinds of enduring livelihood um, vulnerability to the typhoon's trick for the indigenous people. So earlier I have done another studies for the indigenous people, in uh, the Taiya people in the northern Taiwan. And uh, for those Taiya people, uh, they are situated in the road and into the mountainous regions. And as you can see, if we measure their vulnerability, you can find that um, uh, exposure, you can see their different profiles for exposure, livelihood sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. They are in total, uh, I remember it is 16 tribal groups in this area. And you can find that uh, for those uh, indeed tribal groups, they have various exposure and various, various sensitivity. And very interestingly, for those very remote um, indigenous communities, you can find that they have higher adaptive capacity, which is based on their indigenous knowledge. And also they have constantly more used to uh, self-independence in farming, or in leading uh, self-sustained lives. So they present lower adaptive, adapt, adaptive capacity to the hazard related, to the typhoon related hazards compared to the other uh, tribal groups, not so uh, remote as those um, traditional tribal groups. Okay, so uh, this is just to present you that when all those uh, Morocco victims be relocated, then they are more likely to be relocated in a newly uh, built houses uh, more near the city area, the Kaohsiung city area. And of course, relocated in these places give you more accessibility to the city life and to, to the hospitals, the schooling, and the places of work. But still, um, like Maya and Dakanua, those kinds of remote tribal villages, uh, the, most of the indigenous people, they still maintain high identity and many of them refuse to be relocated. And they maintain their life uh, in the mountainous region and suffering from these enduring livelihood difficulties um, uh, because of the typhoon and landslide uh, uh, risks. So 
Apparently, I don't have much time, uh, but still, I hope still hope to give you a glimpse of disaster risk governance in Taiwan. So, uh, I think I'm going to skip this one, and uh, mm, okay, maybe I keep this one. So here is a a a, a framework introduce you that how different levels or different parties in the society should be taken into account in disaster risk reduction, like citizens or the local people, indigenous or in non-indigenous. Everyone has its personal experience, socioeconomic status, has their different feelings about the hazard and different heuristics. heuristics, heuristics. Okay, so when you want, when you want, when they want to put into action for disaster risk reduction, they also have many different social parties to deal with. Of course, you have different levels of governments from central government to local governments. And of course, you have the uh, NGOs, enterprises, and also scientists, which are play very important role in disaster risk reduction regime in Taiwan. So in Taiwan, it's really, the whole picture of all this of participation from all these different parties in the governance in Taiwan. So um, here is a chart showing the disaster governance progress in Taiwan. And uh, demonstrate how different governments work together. Uh, we have the Disaster Prevention and the Response Act and uh, this is based on National Science Council and this Central Government Committee for Disaster Risk Reduction. And NCDR is our uh, um, knowledge base and coordination base for the whole uh, Central Government uh, Committee. And so behind that, you have a city government, county government, township and local community who need to participate in the whole uh, synergy work uh, for this as a risk prevention. And more and more, we now focus on the, oh, I'm sorry for this, is Chinese, but uh, this demonstrates that the government, the government really look into the collaboration between the community side, enterprises side. And also in these two years, we uh, start the program of certificate uh, personnel or certificate expert on disaster risk reduction. Okay, so we call it Fang Zai Shi in Chinese. It's a certificate expert in DRR. So this we have these kinds of collaboration between different levels and uh, communities prone to hazard risk have also worked together with the certificate DRR expert to come up with their community risk map for which they know where, which place they should go when there is a disaster strike and what kind of equipment they have for every community. So it's a quite a, a very nice synergy uh, between local people, governments and, and NGO enterprises. So here is the, I think I'm running out of time, but here is a talk for here is uh, all the content for my today's talk from emergency situation, enduring effects, and build back better uh, for the whole um, disaster risk prevention uh, concept in Taiwan. Thank you. So thank you very much, my Professor Lin, for your very thorough presentation about disaster risk in Taiwan, both from the global scale to the local scales, and also some really insightful discussion about the impact of uh, on indigenous groups. So though we are running out of time, uh, maybe we can take a few comments and questions. So in the audience, if you have any question for Professor Lin, you can type your questions using the comment feature. We'll extend our mm -hmm. live stream for another 10 minutes to answer and address your questions.
Então... Okay, so there's a, there's a question uh, from Therese. She asked, did Typhoon Maraca change disaster preparedness or recovery strategy in Taiwan? Uh, uh, yes, of course. Um, before Typhoon Morocco, we also have many different typhoon strikes, especially, uh, first of all, I should mention that the most important institutional transition of disaster de prevention in Taiwan happened after 1990, 1999, a Chichi earthquake, because in that earthquake, thousands of people died. So that's really changed the whole DRR uh, landscape in Taiwan, which we set up the law and the committee in the central government and the or co which coordinates the whole synergy from central local governments and uh, to local people and to the role of scientists and NGOs. So after that, the second important um, remedy of the DRR law is after Typhoon Morocco. And, uh, and uh, Typhoon, Mor Typhoon Morocco also brought a very important experience of community risk construction. So we set up the uh, committee at city government and uh, central government level who govern the whole reconstruction ma matters after Typhoon Morocco. So in total, over 3,000 uh, families have been relocated. And um, yeah, a lot of good experiences, especially that those relocation sites were picked up like, by the government. But the housing and the whole uh, hard equipment stuff were all uh, put in place by the NGOs and by the enterprises. So that is a very precious pre uh, experience for Taiwan for the coming uh, typhoon uh, uh, strike and the relocation related matters. Okay, so I have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that how within the indigenous tribe there's also some kind of upward mobility even after they got hit by natural disasters. So do you see any kind of generational differences between the younger generation and the older generation in terms of their ability to adapt to uh, change as a result of disasters? Uh, you mean typhoon related disasters? Yeah, in terms of the different age group people, like the younger people, the the senior people, how do they respond to vulnerability differently? Um, well, from my perspective, um, yeah, I haven't really done this kind of study, but I think this could be a good issue. But I think in most of the villages that have that uh, uh, typhoon related uh, landslide hazards were mostly the remote villages, which means that they now, as far as I know and I have uh, studied, most of them are elderly, either elderly people or very young elementary school kids. The middle ages families there almost disappear. I have visited one tribal community before, and if you look at the official report, there are uh, 300 uh, people lived in that tribal group. But if when I really go there, actually only five or six people still live in that tribal community, which means that they suffer from a lot of uh, people out migration issues which were not re reflected in their official report. But uh, if you look at generally, if the younger generation have a different adaptive capacity, probably I would say yes, because they use more smartphone. And uh, so I think they can get message instantly from the government 
that is for the uh, typhoon related hazards aspect but if you take into account the earthquakes hazard for example of course now people are very familiar with the alerting system that your phone get beep uh, when they, whenever there is an earthquake coming so i mean the whole technology really changed the the young generation's behavior about disaster risk but for the remote tribal villages, probably the changes are not so quickly occurring. Thank you. That's really interesting insight. Okay, so thank you everyone in the audience and for attending our lecture. And thank you, Professor Lin, for the presentation. And